the world seems to be putting us in a situation that says, well, here's this ingenious thing I came up with. It's going to stop you flying, growing and globalizing. One of, the, one, of, one of the bedrocks of our understanding of the way the globalized world works, the free movement of people, I don't see that coming back. And I effectively don't see it coming back ever. Will all people go back to the Irish bars? Or squashed up against one another in these wonderful, happy, sweaty places, drinking pints of Guinness and listening to rebel songs? Will they? Will businessmen jump on a flight, you know, to, 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 to Wuhan to try and sell some more BMWs to the Chinese billionaires? Will that happen? What, what does this mean for world trade? And the, 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 thing that, the thing that strikes me is that this doesn't need any human intervention or any ingenuity or any plan. This is simply how it's going to unfold. People are going to find themselves restricted, localized, changed. I'm speaking today with uh, John Doyle, um, my good friend from uh, Brussels, originally from Ireland. And uh, John, I like to say that you um, you work with the EU Commission in in Brussels. You work for them for 20 years, yeah, or more. Uh -huh. You're a lifer. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but the opinions that you express and the statements that you make are your own and they don't represent official opinions of the EU. Correct. Uh, and, and in fact, it's one of the great things about the EU and the European Commission as well, that it's also primarily probably a generator of ideas. Its primary and first function is to come up with ideas, to take initiative for the benefit of European citizens, which is, you know, both a joy and a privilege and a, and, and a responsibility. But it's it's actually the thing that makes the European Union unique. I'm probably particularly lucky in that I work a lot on foresight, which gives us the chance to work you know, outside uh, outside normal strictures. But yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be an employee of the European Commission, but these views and my uh, are, are mine. And they, they sometimes kind of get you in hot water. Of course, we're all in hot water, but... Well, it, I mean, in, in the sense that, as I said, the European Commission ceases to exist when ideas cease to bubble up. And one of my favorite bosses, uh, an eminent director general, famously told me, and this is a spirit that runs right through the commission, he said, it's always better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. Okay. Uh, and and so so that's the, there's a spirit of that runs through the commission you know a, a courageous will to take initiative because this is our duty our obligation our our, our right and our uh, and, uh, and our honor to be to be that part of the system that takes the initiative which is then adopted or not by by the parliament and the member states so the right of initiative and and the spirit of taking initiative and thinking independently is a very core part of what the european commission does Great, great. It's, it's, a, it's not just simply rubber stamping things. No, no. As I say, it, it, it is a public sector organization, sound and efficient management, guardian of the treaties, all that good stuff. But it is unique, I think, in the history of all public sector organizations worldwide in, in, in having this special remit to sit down, think about stuff mm -hmm. and come up with ideas that might ultimately be, be translated into legislation or specific actions. And that, that, that introduces a natural tension. That, that creative tension is good. And, and uh, you know, as I say, one has to work within certain strictures most of the time, but one is also hugely liberated to think freely. I, 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 we, we, we all walk a line in our work, but the Commission is a particularly good place for people who want to bring the creative and new to, uh, to apparently intractable problems. The Germans and the French going to war every 50 years for about 300 years. You know, I mean, how do you stop that? 
Yeah. Okay, you set something up where, where somebody comes up with I, generally very concrete ideas. How do we nationalize the things they keep fighting over? Nationalize is the wrong word, but how, how do we make common what yeah. they keep fighting over? Coal, steel, land. Okay, if these things were kind of in some way a shared responsibility, maybe they wouldn't fight each other all the time. So, yeah. that's, uh, so it's, it's both idealistic and very concrete. Could you, you used one word before that you and I ha know has a special meaning, um, mm -hmm. but we, we need to elaborate on that a, a moment, or you need yep. to, You used the word foresight. Now, it's, a, yes. it's an ordinary language uh, <laughs> member of the, the word in the English language, but it has a special meaning in the context that you used it. Please yeah. explain to us what foresight means. Well, uh, well I, I can tell you what it means to me. My good friend who runs the foresight network within the commission, uh, 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 Nicholas would probably disagree with me, but for me, it's a question of uh, having people of various expertise and various interests consider problems that are likely to emerge. Um, people, people often think that foresight is something to do with predicting, I don't know, what color hair robots will have in 50 years, but it's, it's really not that at all. It's, it's a question of it's a question of providing original and unfettered intellectual uh, insights into how things are unfolding uh, uh, or could unfold or will unfold. I mean, we often, uh, currently, because we're doing quite a bit of work thinking, obviously, around our existing challenges, we, we, we often try and remove the notion of future from foresight. So I would almost call it insight. Um, it's, uh, okay, what's really happening? Um, you know, we, we, we know technically what's happening and we think we understand that you governments have to bail something out or but what's really happening. Uh, so so, so that, that, that tends to be the thrust of the work. Um, and, and funnily enough, it's, it's always as much a learning curve for the practitioners uh, as it is kind of an output for policymakers. Now, in, still, let me get to the, the kernel of what I, I didn't Go hear for you it. say that Okay. Force, foresight is a group. It's a distinct group of individuals who work within the EU Commission. Perhaps, in addition, some who are outside of it, or to gather together. To and you well, nowadays you don't gather together so easily, but you work <laughs> together, you think together, you communicate as a group. Yeah, correct. Uh, and, and, and there are several. In fact, this new commission has decided to mainstream foresight into all policy making at all levels, which is really interesting. Um, foresight has tended to be, uh, um, the, so there will be foresight activities across all the services. So whether it's dealing with research or agriculture or fisheries or strategies for transport, all, all of our Commission services contain a foresight element, and and, and those that for those foresight groups can work quite independently on foresight for the specific area. But then they always then meet uh, in in a in a in a network of to, to to exchange these ideas and see how foresight both the specific insights for their field and the broader insights that we might generate through contracts and so on and so forth might better inform the overall thrust of policy. Furthermore, what the European Parliament and the Council also conduct their own foresight activities. So it's one of the things I often quote a lady called Anne Mettler, who was part of the previous commission, um, ESPAS, which was the European kind of an assemblage of, of, of foresight actors within the three institutions and um, produced this the, the report where they where they explicitly and for the first time and, and something I mentioned when I replaced you in Geneva explicitly and for the first time mentioned that humanity was was uh, was facing a, a, an explicit existential crisis that if we didn't turn this around in a big hurry there was a measurable and not insignificant chance that our species was going over the over, over the brink. Now this this made quite a splash, you know, headline wide, worldwide. So yeah, as a force, the, the notion of foresight is really it's almost a safe space to think, um, and therefore attracts all sorts. Good. No, thank you. I wanted to clarify that because I yep. I, I hold your the group the foresight group in in great honor. 
um, for what it is. I don't think there's anything uh, comparable in the United States uh, mm -hmm. except what's private, you know, in the military yeah. or the uh, yeah. intelligence community. But you you have a public intelligence organization out there. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, public but, intelligence is a pretty good way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Now I I asked you if you'd join me on this call, um, specifically because you sent out, um, and it was an email that I went, whoa. So this is the email that John sent me. Dear Stuart, the following struck me in the context of foresight deliberations here in Brussels. Reflection with the Inter-Director General Foresight and Climate Change Groups on the End of Normal. A, the COVID crisis crises might not, probably will not end, at least on a century's time scale. Whoa. COVID two, three, et al. will come along, forcing humans to reestablish a more normal place in the interconnected web of life, or quite possibly go extinct. This evolution is no longer even nominally under human control, accelerating incidences of novel SARS-type virus and our inability to exercise control will lead to a shrinking and more localized world. International travel will remain very risky for generations. Globalized trade in goods the same. Localization will be the emerging new normal. Again, force of circumstances and the regeneration of natural biodiverse barriers between humankind and our so-called viral enemies will occur naturally as we retreat in number and physical disbursement. Next, a new dietary regime is inevitable as the only for decades defense against our niche competitors slash parasites. Hmm. Money slash debt economic models are already clearly obsolete and will be utterly forgotten within 10 to 15 years. A new mechanism for ensuring we produce what we need and want is emerging, though should also provide fruitful ground for speculation for the many redundant economists who will be available for consultation, their labors in the fields being furnished to the satisfaction of their overseers. Yep, there are still, will still be rich people gaming the system. We will make no more German cars. In short, planning in Northern Europe for this summer's temperature extremes will be addressed as the loss of 20% plus of atmospheric particulate matter will drive many Northern European cities, especially into dangerous wet bulb temperature extremes. I expect this line of inquiry to be largely informed by the irresistible unfolding of events it will certainly not be driven by ideas nor words. So I wanted uh, to discuss that today, if you would. And I spend a lot of time um, thinking about, uh, you know, obviously uh, think, thinking about all this stuff. So um, in, in, in totally understandable fashion, um, the commission, not unlike uh, your own government is desperately trying to keep things going for the time being. Um, so, I mean, the first thing everybody does is try to put some money in the people's pockets because countless millions of jobs in, in developed economies um, are, are, are now are now on furlough. Um, so, how do people keep going? How does the economy keep going? Now, that's I would do precisely the same thing where I in the White House or where I in government offices in Ireland or any other country, somehow you've got to keep the thing ticking over. My opinion, however, is that we keep everything ticking over just long enough for the realization to begin to set in that it never goes back. In fact, it never it never it never assumes any semblance of what we would have come to accept as being normal. Now, 
this seems obvious to somebody who, who, who works in the foresight domain. Um, so, for example, the, 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 we, we, we have loads of excellent experts around uh, you know, who are interested in the whole SARS and the emergence of, 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 of these novel strains of coronatide viruses. It is extremely unlikely that this is the last of these viruses. It, so even are we to entirely master it and come up with a miracle vaccine and so on and so forth, what about next year's one? What about the one after that? What about all the other ones that come? Now, this is a, this is a very powerful uh, uh, thing to have to come to terms with. There is no vaccine. There is no cure. I had never seen this coming. Uh, for me, one of the things that was in the back of my mind, well, I, I used to worry a little bit about antibacterial anti resistance and so on and so forth. But the fact that a virus could be the mechanism whereby Gaia, to use a famous term, Lovelock's term, whereby Gaia suddenly decides to write this particular ship had never crossed my mind. So think just for a moment about there never being an end of COVID or COVID two or three or four being something completely different and even more terrible. Let's imagine COVID three in four years time is something that attacks the kidneys and everyone's running around looking for dialysis machines rather than respirators. So you suddenly are faced with the stark reality that even if I had the best job opportunity in the world tomorrow, would I fly to New Orleans? Would I take a job in Wuhan? Would they let me go to Mexico City? So you suddenly say, that one, of the, one, of, one of the bedrocks of our understanding of the way the globalized world works, the free movement of people, I don't see that coming back. And I effectively don't see it coming back ever. Now, I say ever in terms of, you know, reasonable timescales, a couple of centuries or decades at least. When we have discussed previously at great length, you know, what the world needs to do to get itself off fossil fuels, there was this kind of delusion of human agency that you and I and so many other people honestly thought if we could just tell the truth so that everybody understands, everybody would do the right thing. <laughs> um, and there's the wonderful thing about COVID was the wonderful thing. It's, it's, it's a dreadful thing. I, per, I permit you that rhetoric because a lot of people yeah, are yeah, saying yeah. there's a very yeah. gleaming silver lining to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the, the, the extraordinary thing about it is now this, this decision making is, taking out, is taken out of our hands. So COVID still is still, let's say, in six months' time, We've, we've gotten over some sort of a peak. We're worried that there might be another one, a la the Spanish flu in 2019, 2020. Will all the people go back to the Irish bars, you know, squashed up against one another in these wonderful, happy, sweaty places, drinking pints of Guinness and listening to rebel songs? Will they? Will businessmen jump on a flight, you know, to, 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 to Wuhan to try and sell some more BMWs to the Chinese billionaires? Will that happen? What, what does this mean for world trade? And the, 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 thing that, the thing that strikes me is that this doesn't need any human intervention or any ingenuity or any plan. This is simply how it's going to unfold. People are going to find themselves restricted, localized, changed. Um, the other thing that this does then is wonderfully allow the natural systems perhaps to recover, naturally restoring those biodiverse barriers and in distinct ecosystems, which keep the whole system from being interconnected in a very sterile and we now realize hugely vulnerable way because there's no magic bullet for this. There's no magic vaccine. There's no iPhone app that gets rid of this. What has to happen is a strangely renegotiated place on this planet. I'm not entirely sure we can do it. If I was a betting man, I'd still say we won't be here in 20 years. However, given that the planet is now implementing almost word for word Greta Thunberg's um, proposals 
in terms of emissions reductions and so on and so forth, maybe we have a chance. Well, that, and that's a debate for, for another day, but um, yeah. no, seriously, but I want to go a little bit further down the path that you, you've started, uh, started yeah. us on, which is not only will things probably not go back to the way they were, cannot go back to the way they were, in terms yeah. of our economic view of human reality, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm the, I'm famous for poking holes and saying what we call economics is a particular brand, a particular model called neoclassical growth economics. We may yeah. not be able to go back to growth. We hopefully yeah. will not be able to go back to growth. So what we need, I believe, at this moment, is we need people at the EU Commission and other places. I won't say Washington, D.C., because mm -hmm. we know that's mm -hmm. owned right now by a kleptocrat. Um, yeah. Um, but we need to get some kind of way of distributing goods and services and keeping people alive, albeit not necessarily at a luxurious, privileged, everybody wants the great American dream kind of level. But we need or the great European dream. I'm pretty comfortable too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I am. Well, yeah, yeah. The meme is the great American dream over here. But yeah, yeah I know, I know. Okay, but but not only won't we be able to get back to that is we shouldn't even be aiming for it. So it's it's your job and my job to say, hey guys, there's another way, a la ecological yep. economics, Herman Daly, uh, Kate Raworth, um, and I am looking forward to, to viewing and publishing that their talk. As soon yeah, as it's great, that. it's good, it's good. And anyway, um, I, I would go a little bit further. Um, I, I would go a little bit further. I. <sighs> I find myself, uh, and I mean, we, we both also have an interest in in, in philosophies, both Eastern and and and, and uh, uh, yeah. Western. But I, I suppose, in particular, what's striking about this is is almost um, it almost has a Taoist feel to it. Mm. We have clearly lost our way. Mm. Now we've known we've lost our way. Uh, it's very hard not to know you've lost your way when a 16 year old child would be a far better person to have in charge of a country than the 74 year old man child for whom strangely I feel nothing but pity you know god almighty he must be so sad anyway but you know there's something seriously wrong with the world it must have been the same feeling those brave centurions used to have when Nero was kind of at his worst in, in Rome. Yeah. They must have been looking around and saying, there's something wrong with this guy. This, this can't last if this is the guy taking the decision. So, and it's not just that. We we, we, we can see our ecosystems collapsing around us. The, you know, the barrier reefs, our food systems, the extort, you know, the shift in the polar vortex. We, we know we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. And one of the things that I find interesting about this is it doesn't matter how much you know it we don't seem capable of acting on it and that's fascinating so that's 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 kind of a, the addict's lament um, and what's interesting to me is we have never really had agency in my opinion we, uh, we we haven't had the humility to understand our place in the universe and you know surf along and have a good time but it's now patently obvious that we don't have agency and curiously enough the world seems to be putting us in a situation that says, well, here's this ingenious thing I came up with. It's going to stop you flying, growing, and globalizing. Now, if I had to come up with a plan for saving the planet, that pretty much would have been it. Now, I don't want to anthropomorphize um, <laughs> planet Earth, but wow, that, that, that gives us a fighting chance. In terms of our agency or lack thereof, yeah. Yes, our illusion that we were in control. Yes, exactly. the way I constitute it, and it's obviously just one way of putting it, is that we've had the 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 cart before the horse for a long time, thinking that we could yes. hold money and the economy. But in yes. fact, my thesis, which kind of got me on the road to to being mm -hmm. heard uh, when I presented this in mm -hmm. at, at the climate talks in Lima in 2014, mm -hmm. my point was that money capital m is a thing a virus a meme it's a mm -hmm. thought form it's not the stuff in your pocket predominantly mm -hmm. it's the it's the it's 
all of the the instructions by which we operate and money operates us for its own reproductive purposes <laughs> yeah. i mean when you said bail out when you said bail yes. out that's not the right yep. term because yep. what it means yeah. is that yeah. the the nations are going to their private central banks central banks yep. are not part of the nation they're private and well, they're saying states for sure yeah um, that, except for maybe one or two countries. I mean, mm -hmm. your bank, you, so yeah. they're going to their banks and saying, we got to print more money. We got to try to get jumpstart this, this okay. engine again. And that means put more money out there, put more. And then we know human frailty is what they are. Mm -hmm. Most of the money will go into corporate CEO uh, pay um, and very little of it will trickle down. And they'll give a check to, you know, a little bit of money. So everybody feels like, oh, they've gotten something out of this $2 trillion bailout in the United States. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's, look, it's money reproducing itself across humanity. And money only has the program of consuming resources to make more money. Money doesn't think, but it uses our thinking capacity. Mm -hmm. But money is, is, is in control. And this is the- Well, it's, it, I, I, think, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm enjoying at the moment, and, and, and my boss, to be fair to him at one stage, sort of said to me, you know, I mean, maybe in some of these emails you could stop with the kind of, I'm on this wonderful spiritual retreat thing, you know, because, I mean, we are in lockdown and it is hard and it's difficult for people and we're very privileged. I'm, I'm privileged to live in a nice house where I can lock down, you know, my kids and my wife are upstairs, you know, eating or watching the TV and I have a little room that I can so you know i i i get it that you know it you know the the sort of vanity of sort of saying wow is this cool you can actually see the world go by mm. does not apply to 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 so many people nevertheless i i want to make the point that even the effort that that you're making and the effort that um that that, uh, that herman daly uh, uh was making in, in in earlier talks to sort of understand and, and grasp the principles and so on and so forth i suspect we're just going to be able to let all that go mm. that it doesn't really matter you know there's this wonderful notion of you know uh, that the, the the travelers in the forest like they come to a they come to a river and they make a raft that gets them across the river but when they get to the other side of the river you don't carry the raft on your back you leave the raft and you carry on with your journey. Who knows what you'll need for the next challenge? Maybe it'll be climbing boots. So what, what, what's interesting me at the moment is the sudden realization of the part of so many people, like who's important around here? Okay, so, I mean, for some people, we, we obviously being sort of uh, whole food plant-based eaters kind of do most of our own cooking or whatever, but people are saying, wow, you know, I couldn't do without those Uber delivery guys. They're great. They come to people's doors all the time. You know, they matter. I'm just taking a, a crazy example as distinct from you know, the usual nurse and doctor kind of stuff. Like, who actually matters now? What What do we need? We need. So Belgium is a country of about 11 million people. Okay, it's kind of ticking over. Now we've got to make sure everybody has some money in the bank. Uh, now, hats off to the to, to the Belgian government. That's one of the first things they're doing, putting about 1,500 euros in everybody's bank account, you know, who's made unemployment, you know, yeah. for the duration. And then the question becomes, so what's the duration? And what exactly are you putting in people's bank accounts? Because we all know that fiat currency is made. It's made against the promise of future growth. Now, very soon, everyone's going to realize there ain't no future growth. So what am I doing and what do I need to keep doing and what's being done for me? Heat, shelter, some reasonable food and um, internet's good and I'd like to keep the sewers running. That's about it. So a question I keep asking people is how many thousands of tons of Irish steaks do people need to consume to defeat the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. I think none. Mm -hmm. How many German cars do we need to make to defeat the coronavirus? Again, my sneaking feeling is we don't need to make any more German cars, but we do need to get to the far side of this. So the most basic tenants fall away. I don't, I don't much feel like referring to things like economies and progress. Or anything. It's, it's kind of over. Mm -hmm. 
So what's here now?
kind of feels like the earth just sent us all to our rooms to think about what we've done. Before coronavirus, you you know my position that everybody kind of knows what they have to do. 7% reduction in emissions year on year on year. We've got 20 years to get these down to blah, blah, blah. There wasn't a snowball's chance in hell of that ever happening. And it didn't matter how many cops we had. Let's, let's grow our potatoes in the back garden. Let's start, you know, if you need a car, well, you know, we can car share. I mean, all of a sudden, it's different. Like right now, you can feel the difference. People are helping one another. That old person over there, can they get to the supermarket? Let's just give them a call and see. And suddenly, it's different. Every evening here at eight o'clock, we open the windows in the evening and we clap our hands raw for the medical staff and for the people who are trying to make keep things going. So, we we were asked, uh, you know, in, in 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 a broad context to reflect on what we can do. And I have very specific work that I do within the commission, uh, and and you know, I was able to give my inputs on those things. But as somebody with a with an obligation, a right, a duty to, 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 to use my capacities to think about um, the big picture issues. It struck me that what I needed to also do, uh, particularly in the context of our foresight work, was to raise the big issues. So I guess, um, I guess what I've raised here are these big issues. As, as we look towards piecemeal uh, survival, day in day out that's good but we also need to begin to feel the really profound change so what I said have suggested to, to the groups that I work with is that we begin a reflection inter DG foresight climate change groups all the all the kind of um, ideas stuff that's going on uh, in the EU at the moment we begin a reflection on the end of normal and, and I made a couple of very rapid points. I said, one, the COVID crisis might not, in fact, probably will not end, at least on a century's time scale. COVID two, three, and so on and so forth will come along, forcing humans to reestablish a more normal place in the interconnected web of life. Or we might qu quite possibly go extinct. There's no short term cure for this. This evolution is no longer even nominally under human control. That's the big revelation to me as I sit here in isolation. Accelerating incidences of novel SARS type viruses and our inability to exercise control will lead inevitably to a shrinking and more localized world. International travel, just as one example, will remain very risky for generations. Globalized trade and goods, the same. Localization will be the emerging new normal, again, force of circumstances, and the regeneration of natural biodiverse barriers between humankind and our so-called viral enemies will also occur naturally as we retreat in number and physical disbursement. I would suggest a new dietary regime is utterly inevitable. I would suggest that as the only, at least for decades to come, defense that there is against our niche competitor slash parasite, this particular virus and other viruses, the only real way to, to combat this virus is for people to be extraordinarily healthy. The only way for people to be extraordinarily healthy is to stop the ridiculous, you know, animal products based diet that has been one of the primary contributors to the destruction of our planet to date. Heavy, so, heavy meat consumption, heavy sugar consumption, heavy processed food, dairy, food. fish, all that kind of stuff. Human beings are, uh, you know, are, are, should be eating a plant-based whole food diet largely composed of starches. Dr. Neil Bernard, uh, the, the famous China study and so on and so forth. We've known this for centuries, but it might actually happen this time because there's no stopping getting the virus. But, you know, if your resistance and your immunity is strong, you might not get it. But if you get it and you have strong resistance and immunity, you have a better chance of survival. And we're probably all pretty much going to get it or its first cousin or its son or daughter within the next few years. So 
human beings who do not eat these carcinogenic, uh, uh, debilitating um, uh, diets don't Sit have underlying lying. issues, manage to survive. So, so I think it's something that's going to happen. You don't need to make veganism popular anymore. People just don't want to die in hospitals. I would suggest as well that money and debt economic models are already clearly obsolete. I mean, how many times do you bail out banks and massive big uh, companies? I mean, they're clearly obsolete. If I go further, I would suggest that they will be utterly incomprehensible to most people within 10 to 15 years. People will wonder what this thing called an economy was. One of my favorite questions to people at the moment is, what's an economy? Like, what is an economy? Will somebody tell me what an economy is? I said, the new mechanism for ensuring we produce what we need and want is emerging. I don't understand how it's emerging, but it's all around me at the moment. Mm -hmm. Big parts of it are the smiles and, 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 and knowing looks of my neighbours and people as we get up half an hour outdoors, walking dogs or whatever. Although I would like I to... Uh, before you go on, the one I love is the, the video I was sent of Pedrito uh, playing uh, the theme of the Titanic movie on his balcony and all the other balconies around him in Barcelona were either <laughs> playing on instruments or singing or... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, this is this is very fundamental re-engineering. I mean, you 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 spoke you spoke earlier of um, of money, and you know, and I, I love him. For me, one of the great philosophers of the twentieth century was a man called Alan Watts, who I'm sure you know well. Yeah. And um, but Alan has a wonderful piece where he talks about you know money, there's a confusion way between money and wealth. You know, like wealth is having stuff, doing stuff. Um, uh, uh, money is, is something that that we use, that kind of can approximate to or can in some circumstances facilitate. But he makes this wonderful joke where he suggests that human beings can't go on without the money-based economy is roughly the equivalent of sort of the head of a building site sending his workers home one day because he's run out of inches or run out of centimeters. Sorry, we have no more inches today. We can't carry on building. What? <laughs> it's it's a metric. It's an entirely artificial human construct that has had its uses. But what follows? What follows is the big question. Let me go back to the, uh, yeah. to the email. Okay, so the yep. new mechanism for ensuring we produce what we need and want is emerging. Go on. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, this has me just been a smart ass. Um, I mean, it's emerging on its own, uh, though it should also provide fruitful ground for speculation for the many redundant economists who will be available for consultation <laughs> once their labours in the fields are finished to the satisfaction of those who oversee them. I just want to see every economist in the world with a shovel in his hand digging potatoes, you know, or, or scooping up horse poop to put on the carrots, you know. I mean, talking, uh, talking about something real and not about this <laughs> hypothetical invisible hand of the marketplace here in brussels where i am now that whoa the crazy stuff is beginning to fade away it's beginning to seem ghostly um what's real is standing on the balcony and clapping for those workers what's also real is very unpleasant people for example throwing healthcare workers out of the co-location arrangements because they're scared they're going to bring the virus so so but, but by and large, as somebody has written recently, it's not like the horror movies. People haven't turned into zombies and aren't kind of drilling through people's brains to suck their juices out. You know, it <laughs> seems like people are people are kind of feeling the pulse of their connectedness, not only to one another, but to what is, mm. let's say, invisible hands and econometric theory. And, oh, actually, I'd just like some nice food to eat. I'd like the heat to stay on and I'd like to be looked after. Yeah. Is that okay? Sure. So aside from all of these redundant uh, neoclassical economists, <laughs> ecological economists will not be redundant. They will be needed, but that's my view. Um, okay, so then you say in F, we will be making no more German cars, nor Japanese cars, nor... Right. Well, again, I, I, it's, you know, again it's, it's the example that we, we spoke about earlier. Like, like we knew we had this seriously wrong. Well, one of my favorite things is looking at the statistics on them, um, on things like cars. I say, uh, I'd, I'd like to give the Germans a hard time. I'd like to give the Irish and the French a hard time about, you know, slaughtering, you know, tortured animals at the end of their miserable lives as well. But cars I love at the moment because in most wealthy European countries, we now have 1.5 cars per family. I mean, how many more of these things do we need to make? 
<laughs> the place is pretty small. Um, one of the things you notice now is nobody's using the cars. It's it's kind of nice. Now, somebody's saying, oh, we have to get the economy back on track. We have to get growth going again so that we can afford to... Afford to what? Afford to f- tackle the coronavirus. But no, we have to do exactly the opposite. Somehow the earth has to rebalance, which probably means that we'll just be forced so far back into our little our little clearings in the forests or our little cities that the earth will naturally retake at least nine tenths of what we took from it mm-hmm. and then we have a chance because i mean all the earth is really doing is what any large uh, complex living system does it's it's defending itself it's getting a temperature it's doing some pretty weird stuff and it's killing lots of stuff and it hopes it gets out the far end that's what your body does as well um, so the earth is just kind of, the earth would rather get back to the way it was like something that's in dynamic equilibrium doesn't necessarily want to jump to a new state it will if it has to that will happen but curiously the opportunity presented here is for it to actually restabilize in a in an in, to a climatic and uh, and ecosystem stability that still has a niche for humans how cool would that be because as i say before coronavirus you you know my position that everybody kind of knows what they have to do seven percent reduction in emissions year on year on year we've got 20 years to get these down to blah 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 there wasn't a snowball's chance in hell that ever happening and it didn't matter how many cops we had Cops on the beat, cops in Glasgow, cops in Madrid. It didn't matter. It was never going to happen. Bizarrely, the universe seems to be making it happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like this. Um, it, it, you know, the 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 toll of deaths uh, ticking up, uh, you know, on the local news. It's heartbreaking. It is horrendous. It is. But there is no doubt that what was needed to be done, we would never have done. Yeah. Ever. I mean, what you what we were just saying kind of made me remember uh, yeah. the image of the money, uh, the monkey trap, where yeah. they put nuts in a bottle and the monkey goes in and grabs the nuts and then <laughs> doesn't have the intelligence to let the nuts the, and escape. Open, the just can't open its fist. Just can't open its fist. Yeah. But, yeah. but in ways, it, if we get through this, in a bizarre way, I think it will mean we are profoundly changed. Yeah. Because it wasn't us. Whatever our notion of, you know, anthropomorphic gods and so on and so forth, it will have to be different. Yeah, I'm very, as I say, I, I, something I'd love you to share is uh, you know, John McDougall, Dr. John McDougall's wonderful video made about the 15th of March, you know, on, on how people need to prepare and get ready for the... Um, you know, health-wise and what they need to store and how they need to eat um, uh, uh, for the crisis. And one of the things, you know, he even has the courage to bring up um, speci- uh, 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 speciesism, you know, the, the, the bias against species. Like, who exactly do we think are, we are? Even, even, even our most progressive and intelligent people refer to the virus as the enemy. Who's not? It's a cohabitant on this planet. Yeah. The vast majority of systems, living systems in this planet, operate through what's technically called um, um, uh, mutualism. Uh, um, so we we understand evolution as being something that's always red in tooth and claw. You know, there's, there's predation, and there's um, uh, and there's parasitism. Everybody knows about those two. But the vast majority of things in the natural world work according to a collaborative mutualism. Mm -hmm. They work together. The vast majority of cells in my body don't even have my DNA. Mm -hmm. My microbiome, there's far more things in here that don't have my my DNA than, than does have my DNA. So what exactly am I? I co evolved with this earth. You know, so again, it's it's an aspect. I often think we should have called ourselves kind of, rather than wise men, handy men, because we're really good at making stuff. 
And to make stuff, you kind of reduce the problem to a very specific thing. And even science is like this. The si you know, what is it in this particular plant that makes it good for you? And then we get the extracts and we take it in droplets. But of course, that's completely the wrong question. You, you evolved with those plants. They evolved with you. Science might be able to give you an interesting insight into, is that interesting that it does it this way, that you know, this, we think this is the active ingredient. But we will never know more by aggregating all the individual pieces of knowledge than we do by simply apprehending the whole as it is. And the whole as it is, is we're part of this. And it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And now the part is taking us by the hand. We're going to be punished severely. But for the first time since we have spoken, I have the glimmer of a hope that our species might still be around in 20 years. Mm. That's, that's, that is, uh, that that's is... new for me, as you know. Yeah. That, that... Sorry, it's called obligative mutualism. The, the, well, when I was speaking about predation, parasitism, and mutualism, it's obligative mutualism, which is the one nobody has heard of, and it's what all of nature does. It collaborates. Obligative mutualism. Obligative mutualism. That Love. is the primary mechanism of all Darwinian fitting and evolution. Obligative mutualism. You find your little niche and you collaborate. Mm. You're part of the whole. As I say, we also identify parasitism and predation. And those are the ones we think this is the way nature works. Nonsense. Like I say, I personally think of myself as a meat uber. You know, I carry around all these wonderful little microbiomes who need me. That's it. That's, mm -hmm. that's part of my job in life is to keep these feed guys them. going. Your that's job cool. is to feed the biome that lives in your gut. That's it. I mean, but I'm, not, I'm only kind of half joking. I'm in no way superior to these things. The mitochondria yeah. were a foreign being to the, the, the single cell that they, they got into Brilliant. the ligative yeah. mutualism with, where if you yeah. take me inside of your cellular body, I will feed Love you it. energy if you will feed me. There it now, is. Now, now that's, that's kind of... And, and somehow we managed to reduce everything to the selfish gene and individuals out for their own outlook. I mean, you even stand in awe of the, I mean, I, I look at the medical people here, or the guys driving the buses, or, or the girls at the supermarket checkout, and they are mostly girls to be fair, like they're turning up for work. They're seeing people going past every day who could have the virus. They're turning up for, you know, the lowest paid jobs. Can somebody tell, right now, that girl in that supermarket who ser serves me every second day when I go in to get my greens and whatever and so on and so forth, she is a lot more valuable doing her job to me than any Nobel Prize winning economist yes. or, or, or fantasist of invisible hands or Yeah, or, or even, she, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just thinking how our, our society has it so backwards where we pay yep. our farmers and our teachers and are the people who deliver yeah. the goods and services we need to survive yeah. are the lowest paid and the people yeah. who figure out how to sell us more crap mm. are the highest paid <laughs> Just, I, I i love that i was going to finish my story about the german car manufacturers what i love about them yeah I, i'm being mean to germans i mean it's everybody obviously but um you know it's a, how do we get more cars sold? Okay, we can move into China. And then they have this wonderful... Um, we can lie wonderful... about our emissions. <laughs> you can't say that. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, but I mean, it's the same. I mean, you, you talk to Irish nutritionalists. They're all educated in Ireland. Oh, meat and dairy have a hugely important part on the, you know, on the nutrition pyramid. Well, yeah, if you want to die of cancer or cardiovascular problems or cancer, they do. But if you'd like to live a healthy life and not see a doctor till you're 60 or 70, I mean, maybe you should eat what human beings were designed to eat. But so, so I mean, it's not, you know, yes, I mean, the, the emissions cheating scandal was a fabulous piece of dishonesty. But this dishonesty is everywhere. And, and this is currently what we were incapable of escaping from. And suddenly, we, we didn't even escape from it. It just kind of disappeared. COVID just took it away from us and it's not going to give it back to us, <laughs> which is 
again, short-term thinking, and that's okay. People turn to me and say, well, John, you must be happy. You know, uh, well, all the emissions have gone down. What's happening currently in terms of the climate is the single biggest terror, I would say, that any uh, independent climate scientist could have had, uh, aside from when the um, when the Arctic ice goes, and that'll go this year. The so, blue ocean event. But the blue ocean event will almost certainly occur this year, and that's that's going to that's the challenges this will lead to. You know, not 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 immediately, but in, in the coming years, you're you're looking at easy and extra degrees temperature. But the other thing that's usually frightening is the aerosol masking effect. So few enough people know that one what, what, one of the great benefits of burning coal, coal in particular is that not only does it send out loads of CO2 which warms up the atmosphere, but at the same time it sends up loads of particulate waste which keeps the atmosphere cool. It's like a little parasol, thousands and countless billions of little parasols which reflect the sunlight. Um, we know from 9-11, I'm talking about the second one, um, when the, um, uh, not Pinochet, I'm talking about the one in New York, not 1973 Pinochet, but when 9-11 happened and those aircraft were grounded over the United States, what we saw was um, a plus six and a plus 0.6 and a minus 0.5 swing in temperatures within three days, just from the, just from the contrails. Now, uh, it's, it's difficult to know whether contrails are, are particular waste from fossil fuel burning, and in particular, you know, dirty coal, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the bigger effect. But all the recent papers seem to indicate that we lose 30 to 40 percent, only that, of particulates in the air suddenly. And this will lead very, very quickly, almost instantaneously, to one degree jump in temperature. Yeah. Just bang. Now, so this terrifies me at the moment because even though China might be getting back on track and you know they do a lot of the manufacturing everywhere else is closing down. So bizarrely enough, um, uh, although obviously a climate obsessive, the last thing that I would be shutting down would be dirty coal plants. You you stop the cars first, you stop the petrol first, you stop the diesel, you stop the methane, the natural, everything else, and then slowly start getting rid of you know that particular waste, which is essentially geoengineering us to a degree cooler than it would otherwise be, mm -hmm. as well as, yeah, and the problem with that is losing it instantaneously you get the heating effect almost instantaneously. Putting it up there, the full effect of, of CO2 emissions tends to take about 10 years. So, so, so in fact, this sudden drop in, of all things, dirty coal terrifies me. Europe was within 20, um, 20 percentage points relative humidity and one degree of having a wet bulb event. Sorry, Brussels, as, as I said in Geneva a couple of years ago, whenever it was, Two summers ago, we hit 41 with 40% relative humidity. I, I think you have that, that, that particular slide that I show all the time. It is very likely, therefore, that this summer, given that we'll have far less Arctic ice, we look definitely to have an El, El Nino and you know this particular issue. It is very likely that even as far north as Brussels, we're going to have wet bulb events, maybe for days. Now that will be tens of thousands of people dying in the streets, particularly the elderly and the infirm, because we don't have the air conditioned facilities here. So one of the things I'm interested in doing is getting people to please, can we identify where there's air conditioned facilities for late July, late August, so we can get people into these facilities, which doesn't really work too well with social isolation. Let, let me clarify what you mean by wet bulb uh, for, for people yeah. in the audience watching this who don't understand. You send me a one, sent me a wonderful graphic called the heat stress index chart. You've got Fahrenheit and centigrade temperatures down the left-hand column. And if we focus, say, on 90 degrees Fahrenheit, equivalent to a little bit over 32 centigrade, well, if your relative humidity is 25 or 30 percent, perhaps light showers, then you're in an area on the, char the chart called mild stress. But if you move over just a little bit to 35% humidity, then you're in the area of severe stress. Let's move down to 100 degree Fahrenheit day, about 38 degrees C. And if you move over to 
percent humidity, then you're in the area of very severe stress. And one more move, if you move down to a 105 degree day, which is getting more common, a bit over 40 degrees centigrade, then you move into an area where they say you have dead cattle. Well, what about people out in the street? So at a very, at a curiously low temperature, so your core temperature is in around 37. And the way your body keeps that cool is that your exterior is at about 36. So it can transfer. So the core protecting the organs can transfer heat to the exterior. And the way the exterior gets rid of it is it lets it evaporate in terms of sweat into the air. But if that air, even at only 36 degrees, I'm not sure what that is in, in, in weird American stuff. Um, mm. But even at that 36 degrees, where the 100% relative humidity in the air, evaporation can't occur. What happens is the water just comes out and falls onto the ground. It takes no heat from the core. Yeah, you sweat, you just drip sweat. You, you just, it just falls off you, but there's no cooling possible. Doesn't evaporate. And in the same way, if it's 40 degrees, you only need it to be about 60 or 70% relative humidity. And at that stage, you're cooking. Your internal organs cooked. The fittest person in the world has six hours in those conditions. Yeah, so all those uh, uh, allusions to hmm. the frog in the pot are quite uh, quite relevant. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and, and again, it's a sort of a thing that, and this is a sort of thing that's that's interesting me now. You know, my admiration for you know the guys and girls in the checkout in the supermarket. The um, the nurses going into work in spite of the fact that maybe they're um, the colocataire, uh, you know, are, are scared to let them into the into the apartment. Mm. What it is we need to be doing in Brussels now so that the old people's homes are not scenes of the most dreadful death and carnage come late July, August, if we hit wet bulb, which we will certainly hit in certain areas of Europe, but could easily, easily, probably will hit in Northern Europe as well. So so suddenly you're faced with these very practical, real problems. Yeah. And, and that's okay. Can, can we do something about this? Is there somebody I can help? What can I do? Rather than worrying about how, I don't know, some strange new economic model is going to solve this. Or am I getting the latest iPhone or something like that? <laughs> German car, German car. I need a German car and, and an like, Irish steak. I like to take my shot at Apple because I still have an iPhone 3. That oh, well done. Except yeah. that yeah. they have managed to obsolete it by forcing all of the apps to new, you know, new operating <laughs> system. And, but it still works, works well. And it's, I think. The nice Actually, the Apple one is one of my favorite examples of why, um, of why I think we would never have been capable of saving ourselves and why, you know, our chances now brought about by this coronavirus because one i remember writing a report years ago with a good friend colin joyce and it was called consumer 2020 and we had this sudden revelation wow you know going forward yeah we wrote i think we wrote this in 2010 and i can't remember i think it was 2010 maybe a bit earlier but smart like phones and smart stuff was out and we suddenly realized wow you know we can really reduce the material intensity of the economy because i mean like a phone now it's just it's just a little thing that looks like a skinny brick right so all you need to do is update the software i mean you don't need to use the material anymore that is so brilliant did it make a damn bit of difference? No. Nope. People go and buy the latest iPhone. I can't tell one iPhone from the other. But the Apple Acolytes, oh man, that's a you know a 9C or a 10B or what? How do you know this shit? It's a little square of plastic. You know, so so the notion that humans would have been in any way capable of sort of saying, wow, man, sorry, I'll I will show mine. Wow, man, look, I bought this 20 years ago and I just keep upgrading the software and it's perfect. It's going to love it. I mean, it's ridiculous. The same with your washing machine, the same with your the same with your car, the same with anything. Of course, we could simply software update most of this stuff. Even if we didn't use software, good old Cubans managed to keep those 1940s and 50s cars going to oh, about yeah. today, I think. Oh. The, same, the same people who are sending doctors all over the world to help out there's got to be there's another way of doing this when you don't have a choice well the I, mean, I guess i guess i guess 
Kennedy was Cuba's coronavirus <laughs> in a kind of a curious way and it's never gone away it's never gone away and it never will go away and maybe that's okay are the Cubans so, so badly off rather be in Cuba than in New York at the moment if we return to a, 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 a regime of fixing rather than throwing away repairing yep. so it's not just reduce reuse recycle, oh, yeah. but it's repair repurpose I once yes. went to the exercise of thinking of all of the re-words <laughs> that fit yeah. with that, and I came up with a page full of them. Fantastic, fantastic. And I mean, isn't that a wonderful vision of an economy as well? An economy, isn't that a wonderful vision of people working together? I mean, we've built all this shit. Okay, we can keep it, lots of it, maybe. Let's keep it going. Let's, let's grow our potatoes in the back garden. Let's start, you know, if you need a car, well, you know, we can car share. I mean, all of a sudden, it's different. Like right now, you can feel the difference. People are helping one another. That old person over there, can they get to the supermarket? Let's just give them a call and see. And suddenly it's different. And, and, and we know that this is possible because we've seen experiments in alternative currencies in places like Japan and so on and so on. And you just, it's different. Let, let me add just a couple of items and then we're gonna have to yep. close unfortunately. But yep. one yep. of them is a, uh, a quote that I wish I could remember where I got it. I didn't originate it, I wish I had. Scarcity of words leads to potency of words. Nice. Less is more. Um, the other thing is one that I have at the signature file of my emails going out now, which was kind of feels like the earth just sent us all to our rooms to think about what we've done. <laughs> I I love that one. That is beautiful. And you know, I think that's fantastic. I mean, and again, acknowledging the privileged position I'm in and how the stress that some people must be under. And I say, if this goes on a while longer, I don't for one minute imagine that, you know, the citizens of Europe are going to continue paying me this wonderful salary and let me sit here, you know, do, yeah. doing what I'm doing with you. I mean, it'll change. So I'm not going to be comfortable forever either. But the silence there's so many people admitting to wow it's okay the silence yeah. you wake up in the morning what do i do got a lot of work to do yeah got some stuff to do with Stuart. that's nice too but a lot of the time you know it's you know learning how to live with one another again like this tomorrow when my daughter gets home from um, from honduras there'll be six of us again in the house and two dogs you know and uh, Wow, I mean, how do you co? Wow, this is all so different. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all, it's all beautiful. And one of the things, and just to just even take one more piece out, they say they say that the the student learns something every day, and the master forgets something. So just mm -hmm. to just to take one more piece out of your beautiful thing about the, the 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 efficiency of words when used sparingly, Rumi, um, mm -hmm. that wonderful. Um, um, oh, uh, Sophie people. Poet, he famously said that silence is closest to God. All else is poor translation. Mm 